So let's get started. OK, so I'm going to give you an overview of the key elements of the architecture. You'll be exploring it uh, uh, today. Um, this is sort of the gratuitous marketing slide. It's the, the uh, maybe it's not too gratuitous, but uh, you know, we just want to confirm that uh, we see an insatiable need for performance. Uh, the, the algorithms up here are from the oil and gas industry, and they already know that they could use an exaflop machine. I'm sure all, all you guys could figure out that you need an exaflop machine as well, but everyone says, oh, it's going to tail off. You don't need, all, you don't need to do all this. Uh, our view is, is we're probably not doing enough. Um, and, uh, and, and that's hence why um, this growth and the, um, the complications of that growth, in particular for power, uh, for, uh, as, um, as David was saying yesterday, the, uh, the memory speeds, the interconnects are not going at the pace of flops. So I'm not going to say flops are free. I don't think I can say that for Intel. Um, <coughs> but delivering the whole package is really what we're looking at as well. I'm not going to talk about it much, but Intel, uh, you may have heard that Intel has made significant investments in the last year in interconnect, um, both, uh, both essentially acquiring QLogic uh, and then also acquiring um, the, uh, the Ares InfiniBand capability from uh, Cray and some of their people. At least I don't know if that's closed yet, but it's been announced. So we're looking at all aspects. But, um, you know, we see no end uh, to the use of, again, both uh, traditional Xeon usage, usages and then for uh, key power performance uh, improvements, uh, the mic architecture is, is what we're driving in that area. Um, I pretty much just said it, the, the Xeon's uh, uh, the foundation. You've all uh, used this, this architecture. Um, it can handle the full scope of, of workloads. It has parallel capability. It has serial capability, enhanced. Uh, great, great processor. Uh, most people uh, have uh, uh, great usage of that, including the number four. The number four system is an all Sandy Bridge system, uh, your, uh, you know, from Europe. Um, the number one European system is a full Sandy Bridge Xeon alone system. Uh, just was announced, uh, highly efficient, um, both power and, and compute optimized. Uh, Xeon Phi. You'll hear, me, you'll hear this over and over again, highly parallelized workloads. If you don't have a highly parallelized workload, or it can't be, phi is not there. Uh, another a huge point which we'll continue to hammer home, James will jump on it, is, is the common programming model. Um, we, you know, there are nuances about the architecture, and, and David was showing different architectures yesterday, uh, different levels of cache and all that, but fundamentally we want the experience to, to be the same, You're, what, what you've learned um, to evolve into the usage, not uh, jumping on a, you know, another path, a new brand new interface or other mechanisms in order to leverage that. It's, it's difficult, but that's one of our goals. Um, and, uh, and then again, I, I already repeat it, uh, 22 nanometer is, uh, is the, uh, is the same process that Ivy Bridge is coming out on, and Nice Corner is coming out on that process as well. Um, and uh, the greater than 50 cores, as I said, and again, we haven't said exactly what our product SKUs um, will have or how many SKUs there will be. Um, so just terminology, Knight's Ferry, I already mentioned it. Uh, that was an early development platform. Uh, I can tell you that had, um, we had two SKUs of that, both active. Um, see the active fan there. Uh, 30 and 32 cores is what we had. Um, that, that's been uh, well publicized. Um, Knight's Corner, uh, again, uh, all these things I showed what the announcement was. Uh, we, they, are, they are PCI cards, they are double wide, uh, and uh, GDDR. And then Future Knights is how we refer to what, what might happen next. Um, so what did we do? you know, how did we get where we got? So we, um, you know, we started with these things we call smaller cores uh, and, um, you know, uh, smaller in-order capability. Uh, took a lot of the serial uh, performance out so we could leverage, leverage that. Um, 
And obviously, that allowed us to add many processing cores to, um, to our silicon. To that, we added very wide vector units. Um, I think we can say it's 512 because it's in the, the document. So it's, uh, it's, it's double what the, um, uh, what the maximum AVX side it, size is. Um, and uh, and multi-threading. Uh, we don't call it hyper-threading in this part. We call it multi-threading. There's some uh, interesting differences between the two. Uh, but, you know, more threads to take advantage of the memory bandwidth, the latencies that might occur. Um, it's, it's not a panacea. We don't... Um, so what we're finding is uh, most workloads benefit um, from two to three threads per core, depending on how you do it. Uh, the, this uh, technology will uh, currently, for a nice corner, will do up to four threads per core. You have to be careful how to use it. Michael will, will be talking about that, I believe. Um, but the way I look at it, this is, again, we dial up the contrast for parallel computing. We put a, we put a device out there to push people or, or to engage with the growing need to leverage parallel, uh, parallel computing. And this is a you know, high contrast for that. And of course, the contrast is against Xeon, which obviously has multiple cores and capabilities. But we're talking heavy scaling use, heavy threading, um, you know, basically uh, parallel on steroids, basically. Um, these are some of the markets uh, that we're attacking. It doesn't mean uh, or that um, are appropriate for it. From, we already mentioned energy. Uh, even digital content creation, we, we have some work going on with DreamWorks there. Um, uh, climate modeling, we, a lot of people have talked about that. So all these, these markets, which you guys know well. Um, I don't think we've showed this slide publicly before. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's, it doesn't tell you uh, a ton. This is a very similar slide, actually, to, to David's, um, to, to some of David's yesterday. Uh, but this is a single chip silicon overview. Um, these are the key interfaces. This isn't, uh, this isn't a pure layout look or whatever, but um, you, we've got multiple cores. Um, we have the IPN stands for interprocessor network. Uh, that's how they talk to each other um, and, and communicate across. And then we have memory controllers that go out, that go out to memory. Uh, we have a PCIe interface. Uh, it's a, it's a, a PCIe target, um, target device. Um, and essentially, and, and I think Neil, you were talking about SMPs, right, or, or David? Um, uh, you know, we view it as an SMP on a chip. It has a it has a uh, a network of um, of capability to communicate with each other. It has caches for for each, and then they can be ganged together um, uh, to operate um, as a uniform cache. And we built this for scalable performance. The other key thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit today. Um, it's uh, the PCI interface has a uh, has a DMA engine. Um, it is fully capable of peer-to-peer peer-to-peer -peer, uh, -peer transfers between uh, its own cards and third-party cards. Magic sort of comes in the software that, that utilizes it and what, what you know what capabilities are there. But it, it can do peer-to-peer -peer direct uh, transfers without uh, involving uh, the host other than the host's um, I/O hub. So what's kind of a snapshot of the whole environment? Um, we've got this optimized, highly parallel coprocessor, uh, now called Intel Xeon Phi. Knight's Corner is the first version. Um, it does run complete applications. It has an operating system. It's Linux. Um, you will see today that you can shell over to the card. It's its own compute node. It's on the network. Uh, you can arrange it in a, in a local sort of static local environment, or you can range it cluster-wide to be visible. Um, uh, again, we have the common source code. Um, I th uh, again, you should see today uh, combinations of the styles we use, but you certainly can port a code, and many of our customers in, I, I say an hour, it could be five minutes. I don't, I don't know what you found, <laughs> depending on the code. Um, you just do a switch, target mic, then you just use it as a node, copy it over, and you can just run. Doesn't mean it's going to run fantastic. If it has lots of serial stuff, it's not parallelized. It may run even worse than on a Xeon until you look at the tuning and some of the techniques we're going to show today. 
but indeed you can get started with your data-driven analysis and optimization from the, the moment you engage with one of these parts. Um, it does support standard models of clustering. I'm gonna go over that a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, it builds on the, the advances that, that we've uh, done at Intel in both software and development tools and uh, on our knowledge of parallelism with, with multi-core, wrap them all together, and uh, this is what we've got. So in the environment, it acts as, uh, as its own SMP compute node. Um, now I'm gonna jump into some of the terminology and, and, and uh, what we use um, to uh, describe the environment, how it fits, how we did what we did in order to make it a compute node. Uh, and then, uh, and then some of the usage models. So, um, really, the software package in, uh, at a high level involves uh, two major areas: uh, are what we call our development tools. These are what you're used to: the ICC, the libraries, MPI, all those capabilities. To those tools, we added something called language extensions for offload. That's what I would call one of the programming models we support. It's not the only one, but um, this is this is the model where. Um, where you have sections of code that you want to offload, but you want to purely manage it, manage it as an executable on the, on the host. It works in that mode. It's leveraging that whole compute node thing in the background, but it's a, it's a directive-based mechanism. Um, and then the other half is, is, sometimes we just call them the drivers, but there's a whole lot more to it than that, is the mic platform software stack. So as you engage with Intel, you might hear us use the acronym M MPSS, mic platform software stack. That's the Linux operating system and then everything around it, both host and uh, mic side, to uh, enable, its, enable its use. So these are driver level interfaces. Um, as I said, we call it, a, we call it the micro OS internally. It's, in, and it's sort of an embedded Linux based. It's not, you don't, you don't do Red Hat on this thing. But uh, the kernel's based on 2.6.34 uh, uh, um, kernel. Uh, that we've modified to boot on the mic device, basically. Um, this enables us, by using Linux in this environment, this is really what enabled us. Linux is fundamentally a network uh, operating system. All the standards you're used to just work. We're not gonna give you a special mic command to, uh, to talk to it. You're gonna SSH to the device, or Telnet to the device. All that stuff works. Um, uh, we do have a new, uh, a new uh, term here, symmetric communication interface driver, SCIF. Uh, that's the, pretty much the lowest level we would recommend anyone ever um, deal with the, the card at. It's essentially a light layer that's communication oriented. It actually looks a fair amount like sockets, but it's a, it's a layer over top of the DMA engine essentially. And also you can map memory as well. Um, that's the, that's the, the mechanism. And most of, the, most of our capability is built on top of SCIF, SCIF as far as communicating and pushing data around. Um, and then uh, we do have some middleware uh, interfaces that are targeted to tools vendors. We don't think very many application vendors would, would use them. Our own tools use these uh, interfaces. So we're not gonna talk much about those today. I don't think anyone's really a tools vendor in here. Our design goals in building this, uh, this eco, or this environment is um, you know, to support a wide range of, it's, it's you know, enable for me to stand up in here and say, Hey, it's, it's, it's Intel architecture, it's x86, it's what you're used to. We can support a lot of interesting um, usages with this model, which we'll talk about. It's standards compliant, and then uh, we obviously want uh, scalability. And then we have this thing called symmetry, which I'll tell you about in a second. It's, it's, uh, it's um, hopefully become uh, obvious. Bar bottom line is, is we wanted a broad range because not, not every Workload, not every application, not every system is the same. You need that flexibility. Um, I'm gonna try to explain the symmetry now, the notion of the symmetry. If you look uh, at this diagram, we're essentially trying to uh, block out the environment. Uh, the left side is the host, the right side is, is the card or the Xeon Phi coprocessor. Uh, the dotted line you can, um, you know, is distinguishing between the two and they're connected via PCI Express. And I don't really want to go into every little item here um, that you can see. Really what you should say is, is, geez, both sides look almost exactly the same, right? Why'd you put up a diagram with, with two things? 
We have structured this so that, again, when you engage with the coprocessor, engage with the Xeon Phi, you're not engaging with something new. It's, it's what you're used to. It's symmetric in the sense that if there's a mirror image, essentially, in your mind, when you work with it, you don't have to think about that it's different. You think about that it's the same. Maybe there's subtle differences. Um, the yellow is the Linux micro OS. That is, that is not a Red Hat or Cent OS or whatever. Uh, but most of the things you need are there. Um, and the beauty of it is, is if there's something that's not there, you can add it. If there's a library, if there's an interface, if there's something that exists that would come in a normal distribution, we give you all the tools to compile that, either link it into the kernel or, of course, uh, user mode libraries. So you can extend or limit uh, the environment uh, as you need for your, uh, for your capabilities. Um, and the only other it probably interesting thing uh, that you might not jump out at you um, is, the, um, is the fact that we actually have a DAPL OFED uh, layer capability right on the device. So, um, so, and our MPI is built on top of that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but just keep that in mind. Sockets work, you know, most, most of the programming models that uh, you're used to both high and low. So if you saw what our goals were, this is how we, this is kind of what we came up with to do it. Just to kind of hammer it home, just to the differences um, is, uh, you know, a Xeon typically will support all this stuff on the, on the left from an environment standpoint. Uh, we have some gaps. We don't have OS X or Windows running on the device. And there's obviously, you know, those are, you know, highly, um, highly visually oriented. This is not a visual uh, workstation. So the, the, even though it's a peripheral device, feels like a peripheral device that you could go to, to Fry's or something and buy, you're, you're not going to buy it that way. You're going to buy it from HP. You're going to buy it. So it's going to be in an integrated platform. So it does need validation in a platform. It's PCI compliant and capable, but we're only going to work with OEMs who validate it in a total configuration. Pretty complex thing. We want to make sure it works when you buy it. Um, just to round it up, it's sort of similar. This is just a different look at the previous one. Uh, VE stands for Virtual Ethernet. So um, it, 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 as I said, it looks like a normal network node. We do that by sort of working in conjunction with the lower layers, um, take a TCP stack, and virtualize the, the PCI bus, basically, as, a, as an Ethernet looks like from a software standpoint. Um, and then we have the Mike ABI, which um, James will talk about a, a little bit. There is a, a difference between how the ABI works. That's application binary interface, by the way. That's how, how uh, applications in the OS and, um, and uh, uh, the libraries talk to each other. Um, I'm not going to say much about this. This is what James is going to talk about, but again, Standard tools are being extended to the Intel mic um, architecture. Uh, you will uh, basically one-stop shop when we, when we launch product. The exact same licensing, uh, purchase options, whatever, will include mic whether you have one or not. So it'll just be there um, in, uh, in Parallel Studio. Uh, and, and Cluster Studio, they all will be uh, supporting mic. Um, Uh, essentially, as I said, uh, your, your coding and, and tooting uh, investments pay ongoing dividends. Again, James will talk about this a little bit. One, one interesting thing that we found is since both Xeon and Mike are parallel devices, and, and yesterday you were working to, to vectorize and seeing acceleration, what we found is, is when you, and then I was talking about dialing up the contrast with highly parallel, right? So one interesting thing is we've seen people who either have let's call it semi-parallel code or the beginnings of parallel code, or, and they begin, they're really interested in Mike and they get started, our customers, and they start making headway. And then they might go and try to compare with, with, uh, with the Sandy Bridge or the, the Xeon. Uh, what they find is, is by just working it on Mike, their Xeon code begins to improve and get more vectorized and more capable and more parallel, since that has all the parallel capabilities. So this is really what I meant here by uh, paying dividends is your code that, that might be targeted Xeon or, or you, you're, you want a portable environment where you go to one platform with, without Xeon Phi's and an, another one with, uh, you're sort of doubling 
doubling down and getting uh, better, uh, better performance even uh, of your code as you really just focus on parallelization. And this is the thing we've been telling people, um, sort of the opposite. Well, if you can't have access to it because it's a limited program, keep focusing on that parallelization and vectorization um, and, uh, and scaling with threading and, and other models on, uh, on Xeon, you'll be preparing yourself for Mike. Um, these, this is kind of a look at the, at the models, uh, you know, that, again, that we had in mind a different view of it. Um, th these are the various ways you can work with Mike. You'll see there is a, there's kind of a hole here. And that's the hole James just talked about. Um, normally you would stick uh, the possibility of reverse offload. I just don't have it on here because we don't have direct, a, a direct uh, environment to do it. But we certainly provided enough stuff for someone to go to town and, and, and make their own implementation. Um, if you start on the left here, this is, you know, this is, you know, today for anybody in the marketplace, you've got your uh, Xeon general purpose and zero parallel programming. That's what you're working on yesterday. Uh, you obviously can just worry about that if that's what's right for your workload or where that's what's available. Um, if you step, you know, your first step sometimes, uh, and everybody is different how they look at this, uh, one step would be, I've got, a, I've got code, I've got certain kernels, I'm really happy with my code, how it's tuned on, on Xeon, but I know I'm stuck in Amdahl's law for, for some of the capability. I want to accelerate a little bit. Um, you can use these uh, offload extensions, which uh, Michael will talk, of, talk about, but we call it offload. We don't call it accelerate um, or anything like that. So we have these offload extensions. When you have these parallel phases, uh, then you might want this function to actually go down here and be accelerated. We'll talk about the various ways to use that. Uh, and MPI plays a role, if needed, um, for uh, cluster-wide usage. Or for just MPI uh, parallelization, you certainly can do it alone on the, on the processor. I'm going to jump over here, many core hosts, and it's kind of what you were talking about, is we certainly also uh, have the environment where, if you like, other than uh, being, you know, booting it and, and getting going, you could create an environment where you just focus you have highly parallel app. You don't want to um, spend time on, on uh, coordinating with Xeon too much. Um, you, can, you can create an environment where you can do a cluster-wide uh, nights only um, or uh, Xeon Phi only capability um, that, that exists and, and actually is the fundamental, in a way, is the fundamental baseline. We sometimes call this, you'll hear various terms for it. Uh, here we say many core hosted or, or mic hosted or whatever. Um, we also call that native programming. You're just natively running on the device. Um, and then you have this symmetric one, which also is, is allowed and interesting. And basically, the idea is, is leverage everything you can on the platform and go for it, right? Um, you can have peer you know, MPI ranks uh, on the, uh, on the uh, Xeon, MPI ranks over here. May or may not be running the same basic code. However, whatever works, um, might have to do some interesting load balancing there. But leverage the whole platform, get everything out. And in fact, that's what um, our HPL run did. It, it you know, leveraged the whole platform. Um, and this is just hammering at home. This is kind of a view, mainly an MPI type uh, cluster view. Uh, this is the offload that I, oops, sorry. So I'm not gonna hammer this home uh, other than, uh, do more than we said already because I know we're running out of time. Um, so, uh, we call this a homogeneous network, network of hybrid nodes. This is where you're primarily doing offload and, and all your standard MPI messaging that you're used to today occurs uh, over Xeon and Finiband, and you're using this as an accelerator. Oops, as an offload coprocessor. Um, and, uh, and, you know, primarily using that. So that that's, you know, just sort of works out of the box. Uh, this is the, uh, the other side of the coin I was just talking about. You can have MPI ranks here totally independently with none on here. Um, and uh, talking, uh, one, you can do it between. Uh, 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 one thing they don't show here is, is you could have multiple mics on the platform talking to, to each other directly as well, uh, sharing data, and then actually going out over the network uh, in Vinapand or Ethernet, whatever. Um, so that's that mode. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, and then this is the crazy diagram where you can do everything that everything that you want. Every every uh, every possibility is there. You can have the um, the uh, independent um, Xeon running stuff, Mike running stuff. Them all talking to each other. So it's pretty 
crazy slide. But these are all capabilities that are available on the platform. And then this is just kind of bringing it all together, um, showing you the same, same slide. And really, I want to point out that we have the breadth of capability and then the depth that you're used to with Intel architecture. All these things are capable uh, across both, uh, both products and sort of in conjunction with each other. So, you know, on, the, uh, on both, you know, so this is a both slide, even though it goes across here. So don't, don't think I'm aligning this or aligning that. This is, you know, you have your ease of use engagement. Um, again, uh, Neil was talking about, hey, use the math kernel library if you can. We got math kernel library that works in every mode. It works alone on the, alone on the Xeon, alone on the mic, or you leveraging them together. We call that automatic offload. I, uh, we have an MKL talk on, so we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, and uh, you know, Silk Plus array notation works right on mic. Don't have to do anything special. Uh, the auto vectorization capability, the stuff we were talking about yesterday, uh, 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 Pragma, um, the Pragmas. Uh, we, we can't show it today. We have OpenCL underway. Um, it's, it'll come later in the project. OpenMP works. P-threads work. You can, you can do a thread pool the capability P-threads if that's what your program already does. And you, you know, continue to drop. You could even drop lower if you want uh, anything you think of. Um, and to the point, I just want to point out, as we said, we open source the, the Linux environment. You could, you could change that and figure out enough how to bootstrap your own OS. We have at least two or three customers um, uh, looking at that. Uh, the most prevalent one is University of Tokyo. It's just doing their, they're basing it on the stuff we give them and they're just rolling their own highly tuned operating system. So you can rewrite the operating system if you want. So uh, to wrap it up, uh, we view it as an SMP on a chip. The contrast knob, highly parallel applications are gonna do well. Heavy serial applications are not. Um, uh, you can leverage the, it has remarkable raw compute capability. We can do, um, uh, you know, and the first silicon, uh, again, something that was somewhat unusual for Intel is that we brought a lab system that was only about a week old to SC because that's how, how long um, the first part uh, came out. And that part was able to do a teraflop sustained uh, DGEM. Um, and then uh, you know we've moved forward, and now in the node taking care of that whole environment, we can get a teraflop of uh, of HPL. Um, leverages those ex existing standards, models, and tools. I probably have belabored that point, but I think that's a, a huge benefit to the industry. And then uh, again, we pay, we uh, preserve, and then pay forward. And by pay forward, I mean as time goes on, the more parallel your code is, the more vectorized it is, the more it'll just stay that way and take advantage of the, the benefits. And, um, you know, I view this as uh, it, a lot of people talk about disrupting technology. I view this as uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a disruptive in the sense of changing the game, uh, but it's not disrupting. You can, you know, still use what we have. So with that, are there any other questions before we let James Jump in. Feel like you have a sense of, of what this is about? Okay, thank you very much.